Scientific Framework for Biblical Creation, Session 29. I'm excited. That means we're in the 30s next week. Uh, which is a big mile marker. It's not a mile marker you can stop by because nobody's ever heard of a 30 part class. Uh, you gotta keep going uh, until it's a divisible of 12. And so we are, we are on part 29, looking at uh, problems with the Big Bang. Uh, this will not be, last week was the same topic. Next week will be the same topic. Uh, we will spend quite a few weeks still on the topic of the Big Bang before we go into other, into down the time frame uh, of, of evolutionary or humanistic uh, ideas on how the universe came about. We are gonna look at three problems with the Big Bang tonight. Uh, all our time will be concentrated on these three problems. Uh, there is the antimatter problem, there's the monopole problem, and then there's what's called the population three star issue with the Big Bang theory. Now y'all know what those mean, right? Why even have the class, all right? You guys know you're all you're already there. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna look at those three issues. So you all know the Big Bang is the theory in the in the secular literature, um, at least is the dominant theory on how the universe comes about and then how the universe changes over time. So everything starts 13.75 billion years ago. It starts in, in, a, in an infinitesimal singularity, is what they call it, and, and then the universe expands outward from that point. Everything starts really in a, in a state that we can't even comprehend, trying to squish the whole universe into that much of an area. You just really can't comprehend what, what happens at that point. Well, they think they can. But the point is, as it expands, uh, we start to have uh, atoms or particles as we know them form. Uh, so, so when we think of particles, we think of like protons, neutrons, electrons, um, but those don't even exist in the initial moments of the Big Bang. So you have like quarks and neutrinos and even the building blocks for those particles. And, and so we have particles start to form, we have atoms start to form, this, as we go throughout time and as the universe expands, the universe cools in the theory, and so as it cools, it goes from just being these rudimentary particles and energy into atoms, molecules, dust, stars, galaxies, everything builds on from that moment. So that's the Big Bang Theory, been there, already talked about it, we'll come back to a lot of that over the next couple of weeks still. Some problems with the Big Bang Theory though, there was a reason I just gave the background again that I did because it's related to some of the issues with the theory. Uh, the first issue that we're going to discuss is the antimatter issue, uh, one of the problems the Big Bang uh, Big Bang has. Uh, the atom is the is the smallest building block. Okay, it's not the smallest particle, uh, but it's the smallest stable unit of of matter uh, that we have in the universe. And, and it consists of three parts, right? Everybody knows this, but this is actually important. We have protons. What type of charge do protons have? Positive, right? We have neutrons, right? It's so nice that they named them this way until we get to electron and that's like what happened. It's not a negatron, uh, it's an electron. Uh, but we have protons, positive neutrons, neutral electrons, negative, and, and an inaccurate but helpful image. Uh, it's inaccurate because the quantum theory of the atom has changed what we know. This is like the Bohr model, uh, and we have new models, uh, but generally speaking, um, this, is, this is what we know about the atom. We have the nucleus, which is the neutrons and the protons, and then we have the electrons, which are orbiting outside of the nucleus. Uh, and, and this is not to scale. <laughs> uh, I don't mean that in the sense of like atoms aren't that big. I mean in the, in the scale of protons to neutrons and then in the distance the electrons are uh, from the nucleus, not to scale. Uh, if you were to have a nucleus, okay, this is a rough estimate. Don't quote me on this, even though it's being videoed. If this is a nucleus, okay, like if this is the size of a nucleus, uh, the nearest electron, so there's like electron orbital shells, the nearest one to the nucleus is like a Parker Boulevard, okay? 
uh, and it's this big. It's even smaller than that, okay? Uh, there's a lot of empty space even in an atom, all right? Uh, you don't really need to know that, but I find it interesting. Uh, so we, we look at this and we have these three fundamental parts, building blocks to a atom. Particles uh, don't end here though. Uh, these are not the only particles. Protons, neutrons, and electrons are not the only, are, are not the only base building block uh, for material in the, in the universe. In particle physics, uh, which is a nightmare uh, to study, uh, in particle physics, Antimatter is the antiparticle to the standard particles that we just discussed. Now that helps you a ton, I'm sure, uh, in understanding what antimatter is. Uh, so essentially, it is it is the reverse of a proton, neutron, and electron. Now, sometimes it's still hard to grasp what exactly that means, uh, but but one of the more helpful ways that I've found. Uh, to, to illustrate it, in, in a sense, this, this only goes so far, in a sense, it's like the south to their north, okay? They're, they're what they react with, all right? And, and so in the same way that magnets have like two types, there's like a north and a south to it, matter has matter and antimatter, all right? And they interact in some bizarre, explosive ways. Uh, in a standard atom, the electrons are negatively charged. In antimatter, however, we have what's called a positron, which is a positively charged electron, okay? And so everything about antimatter is the reverse of normal matter. These exist, they're little positrons. They're not really around us here, but we have little positrons, and, and these are positive electron particles. Whereas the standard matter, everything you see around you, uh, the electrons in that matter is negative, okay? Um, you, you look at antimatter then here. For a proton, uh, it's, a, it's an antiproton, is what the, the antimatter particle, or it's an anti-neutron, uh, okay? Uh, neutron, right, electron, proton. It's an anti-neutron, anti-proton, and positron. That's the only one they came up with a cool name for. Uh, but then you can take atoms as a whole. So we have hydrogen, and then we have anti-hydrogen, which is an atom of hydrogen that instead of being a positive center with a negative electron, is a negative center with a positive electron, so to say. It's, it's the opposite. It's, it's uh, a, whole different, a whole different set of particles that make this up, all right? I already just told you that, so we're not gonna go over it again. Now, this is not something that's theoretical. Some people think this is just some weird idea people have. We actually make this in the laboratory. Uh, we actually know how to make antimatter. The first time we made antimatter was in 1995. And if I remember, oh, it's right there, never mind. We created nine uh, antimatter hydrogens in the laboratory. And we've done it many, 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 many times since uh, because we figured something out, which is the problem I'm about to tell you, okay? But this is not simply theoretical. We've done this hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, in the laboratory. The modern day theory of antimatter began in 1928 with a paper by Paul Dirac. However, the term antimatter was coined back in 1898 in two letters written in Nature by Arthur Schuster. The idea is not modern. Uh, some, some Christians have like this knee-jerk reaction to, to things like antimatter and black holes because they think it's associated with a secular humanistic worldview and trying to make their model prove. Uh, antimatter was discovered, well, was hypothesized uh, long before the Big Bang Theory even came out, okay? This has nothing to do with the Big Bang Theory. This is something completely detached from that theory altogether, uh, and it ends up being a problem for the theory. So what's the problem? When matter is created by means of energy, so when you, you all know Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, all right? It's the, and that's one of the governing um, 
equations for the mass energy transfer. So, so mass and energy are really the same things in different states. You can take energy and you can turn it into matter, or you can take matter and turn it into energy. That is the atomic bomb. Okay, that's what you're essentially doing, is you're taking matter and you're quickly turning it back into energy and it causes a nuclear explosion, all right? And so you have an energy. Uh, you, you have matter and antimatter. When, when matter is created, antimatter is generated at the same time. So if you take energy and you say, I want to create 10 atoms of hydrogen, when you do that, you automatically create 10 atoms of anti-hydrogen at the same time. You cannot take energy and just get matter. When you take energy and convert it, you get half matter, half antimatter. Every time. Okay? Uh, this, is, this is undisputed on, on all sides and all parties. Uh, when you take, uh, you know, really need to know all this, but when you take particles, you blow them together, uh, you get a bunch of energy in on it, uh, you start to create things, antimatter being one of them. We don't need to go through this chart in any detail, uh, but if you're interested, uh, quarks, leptons, and bosons are, are more fundamental particles uh, than electrons, protons, and neutrons. So if you ever want to waste like 30 hours, I believe Stanford, uh, one of those big ones, put out a whole series on particle physics uh, that's a big waste of time, but very interesting, okay? Uh, you'll never do anything with it. You'll never be like, oh, there's a lepton. Uh, it just never happens, um, but you'll know what I'm talking about tonight, and one day, you're gonna go on Jeopardy, maybe. And, and they're gonna have the particle physics section, and half those people aren't even gonna know what leptons are, okay? Anyways, so we've confirmed antimatter, we can convert energy into matter, and you get antimatter. Here's the problem. The Big Bang claims all matter comes from energy. That's how everything comes about. It all starts with a burst of energy. All matter that has ever formed in the universe comes about from that initial energy. The problem, we have very little antimatter in space. All right, almost all the matter in the universe is normal matter. And when you create matter from energy, you get equal parts antimatter. And so the problem is, what we should have is on the left side, equal number of matter and antimatter. I believe you have this chart. And on the right side is what we actually have, maybe 15% antimatter and 85% normal matter. Makes no sense if everything came about from energy, because you should expect 50-50. Uh, this problem is, is not uh, ignored by the secular literature. Uh, they even have a name for it. It's called the Baryon number problem. Uh, in terms of why the number is different on those two particles. But the problem continues. If equal amounts were formed in the Big Bang, antimatter and standard matter react with each other and turn back into energy when they come in contact. When these things, these things, if they, if they hit, they turn back into energy now. And so the question is, how can stable matter form, uh, which the universe is made of, okay, if it keeps converting back into energy from all these reactions? If you have everything in an area this big, you can imagine that everything's touching. Let me just, in case that was hard. If you put everything in the universe into this size, you can imagine everything's touching, okay? Now, even if we expanded the size of the planet Earth, you can imagine everything's touching. How is standard matter and antimatter both going to exist in that small of a region and not just react and turn back into energy the whole time? How on Earth are these things gonna coexist like that bumper sticker says we should, but that's another topic for another class. How are these things gonna coexist 
in that state. Do you know how? Well, apparently, immediately after the Big Bang, everything got spread apart super, 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 super fast. Inflation theory, right? Which we talked about last week. Uh, so maybe they will get these things far enough apart that they don't react. But we should still have 50-50. You can't get rid of the antimatter because that would mean you need to get rid of the matter for that reaction to take place. They always stay 50-50. And that's not what we find. And the other problem, they have to appeal to inflation again, which is a lacking theory, we'll just put it that way. All right, so that's the antimatter problem. The monopole problem, here's the next one. Uh, Y'all know what a magnet is, right? Nobody, wow. Some people were nodding their head when I said antimatter. Um, but nobody knows magnet. Uh, Y'all know what a magnet is, right? Magnets have two sides. They have the north side and they have the south side. Uh, and that's just because they happen to be on the north and south parts of the earth. Is why we call them that. Um, what happens when you take a magnet and cut it right down the middle between north and south? Nothing. You get north and south again, right? Um, the the magnetism um, in a magnet is, is caused by uh, basically how you align the electrons, okay? Uh, and so what happens when you cut it down the middle, the electrons immediately realign into north-south, okay? There's never a moment when you have north detached from south, okay? At least not in our standards, in our standard understanding. Uh, normally speaking, you can never have just north. You can never have just south. The electrons will never form in that way under normal conditions. Now you should understand by now, I keep saying normal conditions, okay? Which means there are conditions that are abnormal where this should be able to happen. And under these conditions, you can get what's called a monopole. Mono simply means one. So it's a single pole, one-sided pole. Uh, so a monopole is a magnet that only has one pole and is either north or south. I mean, you, you probably wouldn't call it that, but it's a one-sided magnet. Now, the conditions for creating these monopoles would actually be present in the Big Bang. You just need extreme heat in order to create these things. And the Big Bang, guess what? When you take everything in the universe and you put it this close, you get some extreme heat, okay? Uh, and they don't actually dispute this. The Big Bang should have created monopoles, like massive monopoles, like ginormous monopoles. What's the problem? Uh, we can't find any of them. We have never found a monopole. This should be pretty standard in the Big Bang. We should find these things. They shouldn't be that difficult to find. We have never found it before. And what gets me about this is that they keep saying that they've almost found them. Has anybody played hide and seek? Yes? Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, one person. Um, Hide and seek. How many of you have almost found people while you're playing hide and seek? Now the only way that works is in a process of elimination idea to where if you know they're in your house and you've thoroughly searched upstairs, you've almost found them because they're downstairs maybe. Uh, but believe it or not, that's not how it works when you're talking universal scale, okay? Uh, you don't almost find something. You have two options in reality. The first option is you found it, and you all know what the second option is. You, you have almost found it. That's the second option, right? Now, the way we know they have almost found it is because the theory says it's there, and they're looking. Have you almost found the unicorn in this building? Now, if you're convinced there's a unicorn in this building and you're looking, you have almost found it because there's only so many places it could be in this building. 
Uh, but maybe the problem is there's no unicorns, okay? Anyways, I spent too much time on that slide right there. Um, but I've been laying in bed for a day. I don't know what that has to do with it. Dr. Jason Lyle, he said, particle physicists claim that the high temperature conditions of the Big Bang should have created magnetic monopoles. Since monopoles are predicted to be stable, they should have lasted to this day. Yet despite considerable searching, monopoles have not been found. Where are the monopoles? The fact that we don't find any monopoles strongly suggests that the universe never was that hot. This indicates there never was a Big Bang. You will be happy to know I, I mean, I'd, oh, I'd be willing to bet that your tax dollars have gone to help find the monocles, okay? Someone got a grant at some observatory to look for monocles. They are absolutely useless because it's not like we'd say, oh, look, I found one between Earth and Mercury. Let's go get it. It's not like we're ever going to get a monopole. It's that we'd discover it in deep space and just be able to say there was a monopole. Not going to help anything except their theory, uh, which doesn't really help anything in a pragmatic way, but that's okay. Keep in mind, uh, discovering a monopole wouldn't actually prove the Big Bang, uh, but not finding it sure casts doubt on the theory. If they find a monopole, it's not hard to imagine God created a monopole. It's not hard to explain in our theory. Uh, it wouldn't prove their theory. There are many theories that could explain a monopole. But if you don't have a monopole, if you never find these things, that sure is a crippling uh, blow to their theory because their theory demands that they exist. Population three stars. This is the final of our three problems that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, by observing the light of stars, uh, we can get an idea of the composition of those stars. Uh, so essentially, uh, what happens, different, different elements burn and release light at a different wavelength, so to say. Uh, and when you run it through a uh, spectrum, uh, if, you, if you plot a spectrum, uh, there will be different spectral lines. Okay. Essentially, <laughs> uh, you can tell what is burning by the light, okay? So when we look at stars, when we're talking about the composition of stars, we're talking about what kind of elements are involved in the energy creation of that star, the fusion of that star, and then by observing that light, we're able to tell things about that star. Cool, right? So, so we can get an idea of the composition of stars simply by looking at light. If, if there was ever a discipline in science that they figured out how to get a lot of information from a little bit of observation, it's astronomy. All they have is light. Think about it. Now, now they can infer things from that light. I know that sounds weird, but all they do is look at the light and, and then, or they can look at the motions. That's, I guess, the other thing they can look at. And everything we know about the size, the distance, uh, the composition, the heat, the everything is, well, we saw that little speck of light and here's everything we know about that light, all right? And it tells us the size of the star, the heat of the star, the location of the star. It tells us a lot of stuff, uh, pretty impressive. The point is you can get the composition of stars uh, based, on, based on the light. Now, one way, the traditional way to categorize stars is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, okay? Now, if you're a nerd, you knew what that was, okay? The HR diagram, y'all never sat up at night charting the HR, no, nobody's done that without being paid. Um, the HR diagram, right, have you ever heard of like a, a, a red supergiant, okay? Top right of the HR diagram. Uh, have you ever heard of a, a uh, Blue O type star? Anybody heard of a blue O type star or a blue giant? Okay, top left side of the chart. Has anybody heard of a main sequence star? Have you ever heard the term main sequence? Our sun is a our sun is as average of a star as it, they come. Okay, we are in the smack middle of the main sequence of stars on the HR diagram, and thankfully we are. Without it, we'd be dead. Uh, has anybody heard of a white dwarf? 
at night at the star, okay? People are like, yeah, I met one one time, one of the star, okay? Um, bottom left of the chart. Anybody heard of a... <laughs> I shouldn't say brown dwarf, now, should I? Because <laughs> that's another type of star, and a red dwarf, and a black dwarf, and uh, there's so many types of dwarf stars out there. Um, anyways, that's all HR diagram. That's, for tra that's the traditional way that we categorize stars, okay? At least um, commonly, that's how we categorize stars. There's another way to categorize stars, though, uh, based on their comp composition. The HR diagram is, is worried about uh, mass and temperature, okay? That's, that's what it's worried about. It's the size of the star and the heat of the star is all the HR diagram. Uh, charts. Now those are probably the two most important things to know, uh, but what we want to look at is the composition of stars, what they're made of, right? Uh, when you look at astronomy and cosmology, when, when you're categorizing stars, uh, heavy elements, uh, when, I, when I say heavy elements, uh, they are typically considered to be anything above hydrogen and helium. Now, if I say heavy elements, normally, you know, everything, uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, I mean, the first several are all light, I mean, in comparison to lead, right? Uh, but when we're talking about stars, uh, light is hydrogen and helium, heavy is everything about that. And so when they're looking at stars, one way that they classify stars is based on the amount of, of heavy elements in those stars, everything above helium the amount of heavy elements. Now, the vast majority of the universe is made of hydrogen and helium. Vast majority of the universe. Uh, the vast majority of every star is made of hydrogen and helium. Our star is made of hydrogen and helium. The gas giants are primarily hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium, by far the most abundant elements in the universe, but we do have other elements. Uh, considering we're all made of other elements, okay? Earth is made of other elements, uh, and some stars are made of other elements. So there's three classifications for stars based on what type of uh, elements are found in them. So you have what's called a population one star. This is a star which contains a large amount of heavy elements. It's just saying lots of heavy elements. Now, in my book, being me, I would have put three as having a lot, because three is more than one, but they didn't do that. They decided that one is a lot, so this is golf, okay? One is a, is a better score than three in terms of heavy elements. So population one star, lots of heavy elements. Population two star, medium, some, heavy elements. Population three star, no heavy elements. Simple enough. All right, the important one on here is population three, a star which contains no heavy elements. Why is that important? You remember the Big Bang, right? Not like, or any, not like literally remember, but you remember talking about the Big Bang? You remember how the theory works? So at the beginning of the Big Bang, all we have is energy, yes? After that, we begin to form very basic particles that can exist in that type of uh, uh, situation, uh, environment. We have quarks, things like that. And then after that, uh, we, we get things like hydrogen and helium as, as uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons form. You have electrons and protons start to create hydrogen. You get groups of them start to create helium. And, and almost everybody in the secular realm is in agreement that the Big Bang would only create hydrogen and helium. That in order to get the higher elements, you, you essentially need to fuse them in stars, okay? Because you don't just randomly go, oh, two helium, they went together and they formed beryllium, all right? That just doesn't normally happen. So you're not gonna fill the universe with heavy elements. 
without stars, because there's nuclear fusion in the core of stars, without nuclear fusion, and fusion builds the elements, so in our sun, we're building hydrogen to helium, right? And, and our sun is able to build uh, those elements up. Uh, the initial conditions of the Big Bang are only sufficient and only last long enough in the theory to create up to helium. So everything in the universe, in terms of matter, should begin as hydrogen and helium, and everything else we have after that must form in the cores of stars through nuclear fusion. Those stars then blow up, and then they then come together and form new stars. We'll talk about that in a future week, but that's the theory. So the problem is, when we look at the earliest stars that would form in the Big Bang Theory, every single one of them should be population three, which means hydrogen and helium. Why would you expect everyone to be population three? I was actually asking you, but that's okay. That was fine, I got to take my drink because uh, nobody responded quick. You would expect that because there's nothing else in the theory. Everything has to start out as hydrogen and helium. All stars, initially in the theory, have to start off as population three. Now these stars, not all of them, but certainly a large number of them, should be able to last for billions of years in their theory. And we should still be able to see the light from these stars today on all accounts. These stars should still exist, and even if they've blown up, because these stars are also billions of light years away, we wouldn't even know yet, okay? Because the light has to travel to us, right? When we look at the universe, though, we have observed, we have estimated there are roughly 100 billion galaxies, each containing roughly 100 billion stars, which means 10 to the 18th on the number of, of stars, right? So you go million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, septillion, sextillion, I think. Uh, I may have mixed those up, ontillion, octillion, it gets crazy. But somewhere around sextillion is how many stars there are supposed to be. And out of all the hundreds of thousands to millions that we've observed and studied, not one of them is population three. And literally, billions of stars the entire initial wave of stars in the entire universe should all be population three. And we can't find one of them. Every single star that we see, every single star that we observe has heavy elements in it. Some of them may not have as much as others, but in the theory, you can't have any until the first generation of stars. Some of them need to blow up and release that material into the universe for other stars to form out of it. You don't have any of it, okay? You don't have anything as far as population three stars go. Uh, Dr. Danny Faulkner, he said, since current cosmological theories demand that the universe began with a composition, I should say something real quick that I just caught and I think you made a face. Uh, there are certain elements that are found in every star that are only generated in supernova when a star blows up, okay? So, so it's not to say that you create the initial wave of stars and then the stars build the elements inside. There are certain elements that you cannot get unless the star explodes. And, and so you can't just say that the population one stars have fused to higher metals. They need to blow up to get to higher metals and then they wouldn't be there, all right? So we should still find stars without these heavy metals. Does that make sense? All right, now we'll go to the quote. Dr. Danny Faulkner uh, is an uh, astronomer. He said, since current cosmological theories demand that the universe began with a composition entirely of hydrogen and helium, it is believed that the very first generation of stars should have no metals. 
Such a primordial generation has been dubbed population three and a vigorous, unsuccessful search for these stars has been conducted. But don't worry, they've almost found them. No, they haven't said they've almost found these. They're trying to figure out other ways around this. You can't observe millions of stars and say, well, you know, we just haven't hit that 20% that we're looking for. I mean, after five, you should have hit it. Uh, after millions, now we need to rethink the theory. But they can't. You can't rethink the theory when it's the only theory you have, besides creation, okay? You can't rethink the theory when there's no other alternative to explaining the universe except God had to make it. All right, except maybe the biblical model is correct. Maybe your secular humanistic model is just wrong altogether. Uh, so even though many of these things should cause them to abandon the theory, instead it'll cause them to have endless numbers of bandages they put on the theory, like inflation, to try to get around all the issues that are discovered and all the issues that come up because going to another theory is not plausible at this point uh, because there is no other good theory uh, except creation, but you know how many of them feel about that. So we've observed millions of stars in the universe and still we don't have one of these. They should still be here. And since they are not, it's good evidence the universe didn't start in a big bang. Now once again, this is not a, a two-sided coin in the sense of if they exist, the Big Bang's right. If they don't exist, it's wrong. Look, if you find stars with just hydrogen and helium, it could just mean God created stars with hydrogen and helium. It in no way proves the Big Bang theory, all right? All it would do is show the Big Bang theory is consistent with that observation, as could other models be. But if you don't find any, once again, it's incompatible with the theory. It doesn't work at all with the theory. And, and so these are not arguments that if one day they discover a population three star would prove the Big Bang. They're simply arguments that since they have not found a population three star, it is strong evidence that the Big Bang is not correct. Now, in, in future lessons, you're gonna think we're, we've been skipping over stuff. There is still so much to cover. Uh, we still have to talk about things like star formation galaxy formation theory, planetary formation theory. Uh, it, it's one thing to say, well, if we have this first generation of stars and they blow up, they'll create these uh, new stars that, that was assumed when they say that, that somehow these new stars are just gonna happen to form. Uh, it turns out there are some obstacles. Now, how many would have thought this? There are some obstacles taking this cloud in outer space and making a star suddenly. It's actually not that simple. Uh, and so we're gonna look as we go on, we need to look at star formation, we need to look at galaxy formation. When we get to the solar system, we'll look at planetary formation. Uh, but next week, next week, uh, I think what we're going to do uh, is discuss the topics of dark matter and dark energy, because those are fun. Now, a lot of creationists, when they talk about these things, uh, they also throw in the, the question of black holes. Now, do not feel bad either way that you respond to this question, okay? But does anyone here um, have doubts about the existence of black holes and think that they're inherently tied into the secular model? Don't feel bad if you do. Okay, so, so I, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, discussing why we're pretty sure black holes exist. Okay, we're almost positive black holes exist. Um, and, and so I'll look at black holes, dark matter, and dark energy. Those are usually clumped together as, as strange, inferred things. Um, some of them I believe in, some of them I'm not sure of, and some of them I don't believe in, okay? Uh, outright. And so we'll look at that uh, next week. We'll spend the whole week talking about that topic. Uh, bring your thinking caps once again, all right? Uh, because it'll get a little bit detailed uh, in that discussion. Any questions, any thoughts? I know I...